I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of The Great War on the Road. Now, today we're in England at the Tank Museum, Bovington, and this fine gentleman and I are going to talk about tanks. <laughs> Now, can you tell everybody out there in, in TV and YouTube land who you are and what you do and a little bit about the museum? So, my name's David Willey. I'm the curator here at the Tank Museum. The Tank Museum is based in the southwest of England, way away from anywhere else, because this is where they came in the First World War to train with this new secret weapon called the tank. And the army came back after the First World War. The tanks were brought back from France littered the fields around here, chopped up way into the 1930s, but they got some of those tanks, put a wooden fence around it, and used it as a teaching collection. And that's the beginning of this museum, and we've now got over 300 vehicles here, um, probably the best collection of tanks in the world, as well as an outstanding collection of First World War vehicles. Uh, now, if you can imagine that 300 tanks takes up a lot of space, you're absolutely right. When we were coming here, I didn't think it was going to be quite this massive, but yeah, 300 tanks takes up a heck of a lot of space. Now, I'd like to talk about what we're standing in front of right now. Now, this is a Mark IV, right? This is a, a genuine Mark IV First World War tank. This is the type in Britain we made the most of in the First World War. Over a thousand of these tanks were made, and we think this particular tank stayed here at Bovington, was probably used as a training tank. The only issue we've got is with a number of our tanks in the collection, as time goes on, we've actually been finding more things out about them. Okay. Because over time, when you've had things that were called gate guards, so sometimes you had a tank that sat outside a base somewhere, bits of it were nicked to help restore another tank or things changed around. So some of the time, we're actually finding more information out as time goes along. Now, this is the male version of the tank. There's a male and a female version that we talked about in the tank special and stuff. Can you tell us about the, the, the armaments that both the male and the female would have? Yeah, on here, if you want to have a closer look, this is what's called the six pounder gun. Um, nowadays, we'd probably call it a 57 millimeter, size of the hole across the end of the barrel. At this stage in the British military, they're still talking about the weight of shot that the gun fires. They start off in the Mark I tank by using ex-naval six pounders. They're much longer. Okay. And the problem they had there was that when the tank's going across rough ground, these longer barrels could dig into the ground, uh -huh. catch on a tree stump. So they shorten them and then start actually producing uh, specifically for the tanks what they call a Hotchkiss six pounder. And again, in this slot here, you'd actually have the telescope behind here built onto a sponson, the bit that's on the side. So this carries on from the naval effect coming off for the naval battleships. And the idea with the Mark IV, they've got it now that you can push the sponsons inside the tank for transport on rail. The Mark I, they unbolted them and literally had to take them all them off when they were going to travel. And now this will have two of these and it had uh, the male, was it four machine guns or five machine guns? Um, depends on what role they're going to be okay. playing. Now, now again, on this one with the Mark IV, they're, they go through a period where they're using Lewis guns yeah. and Hotchkiss machine guns. And if you look on our ball mounts here, these are actually the mounts on here are for Hotchkiss machine guns, not the round-ended Lewis guns. And they had pros and cons for using the different types of weapons. The Lewis gun, they found when they were firing it from inside a tank, tended to suck the air back inside oh, right. and start poisoning the atmosphere. Um, the British Army, because we'd had the Hotchkiss machine gun in service with the cavalry right from before the First World War, they actually quite liked the Hotchkiss, even though it only fires a strip of bullets yeah, on a little tray. Yeah, I had been reading that it was different in, in ammunition, but I didn't know which way it was. Um, now, how heavy are these things? I mean, you can see, you know, he can see and everybody can see that these are massive, massive machines. But how, just how massive are we actually talking? You're looking at a 30 ton vehicle here, so it, it's a pretty big weight. And even with this, the tank we've got here, a Mark IV tank, you're still looking at a construction process that is, um, even though they build a thousand, everything is almost custom built. Um, so taking a plate off one tank and trying to put it on another, you'll find they're having to re-drill holes and do bits and pieces that way. Um, and you're also still looking at a generation of vehicles with a Mark IV, that they've got major mechanical problems all the time. So the idea of 
30 tonnes, the last thing you want to be doing is driving this until you really have to. Hence, back to moving it on trains, getting right. it nearer the front line that way. You offload, you do the driving at night, so hopefully the enemy don't actually know where you are or don't hear you. Sometimes when they're getting it up to the front line, they're actually flying planes over the top to try and mask that noise from the enemy. What the problem with those early tanks, so many of them are breaking down yeah. before they even get to the front well, we line. We saw that before they got to the starting line. Um, can you tell us about the difference between the male and the female? So yeah, with the male tank, so you've got those six pounder guns. Um, they have a female which has a slightly smaller sponson and that has two machine guns in. The Mark 1s have Vickers machine guns. Later on, again, they're trying other combinations, right. to put, uh, whether it's Lewis guns or Hotchkiss machine guns. The general gist behind it is they think the female on the First World War battlefield is more useful than a male. They make them about 50-50. Yeah. Um, female tanks, when you think of a First World War battlefield, if the tank's advancing over all that rough ground, spraying away towards yeah. the enemy positions is probably just as effective as trying to stop and aim one of these six pounds of guns. Sure. Because quite often, if you see those, again, frontline photographs, there's very little for a six pounder gun to fire at. Now they fire armor piercing, so a solid shot. You could fire that at a pillbox, or um, if you think there's something really worth taking on. But on the whole, they're either firing, if it's infantry, they fire case shot. Okay. So lots of equivalent of like little pellets and ball bearings. Um, so it's firing almost like a shotgun, okay. uh, and that can shred away a position as well as, sadly, people. Um, so again, high explosive they're, they're going to be using. The problem with a six pounder though is, again, finding a worthwhile target yeah. on a First World War battlefield. So female tanks on the whole tend to be more useful. Now, what was the crew situation like? How many people would run one of these? So was it a standard crew uh, and, or was it a variable thing? No, no, no. You have eight men. You're trained together. Eight men actually crew uh, a Mark IV tank. You need four guys to drive it okay. and four guys man the guns. Um, so two on either side, whether you're a female tank or a male tank, two of you are on the sponsons. Four of you needed to drive it um, because we can have a look inside and actually see what it looked like. Okay. But the general jest is when you're driving along, this is not a one-man job. No. Two at the front, two at the rear. You're all needed if you're going to turn or maneuver this tank. Um, so can we go inside? You can indeed. So we put some steps there. So watch it as you climb in. Everyone says, yes, yeah, I'll be careful. And then they go and bash their head. So watch it climbing through. Try. And as you can see, it's a pretty cramped space in here. Yeah. I'll squeeze past you. I'll go up the front to the commander's okay. position. Commander's position. Now, so tell us a little bit about just the interior in general. I mean, you told us about the crew. Um, you can kind of see who sits where, sort of. But uh, well, just there, there's the, the seats is a sort of. There's only really two proper seats. Yeah. I'm facing the wrong way. I'm sitting where the commander would sit. We'd be looking out that way. Driver would sit over there again, looking out the front. Yeah. Um, these are almost considered the best positions because of you've got the chance of a bit of air coming in yeah. as you're driving along. Obviously these vision ports are closed down as soon as we start heading into action and you look through and the top here a little silvered mirror would actually go in there and so it works like a little periscope so you right, look through so and it yeah. actually looks out the top. Um, some of the tanks as well they put glass prisms in again silver top and bottom so you've got like a periscope yeah. problem of course is as soon as bullets hit that glass it could shatter That's it doesn't come inside but, but it may still, shatter the glass and then you're effectively oh. blind that way so another one of those vision points there this is where a ball mount for putting a lewis gun facing forward okay uh, if we need to face forward and one of the other things that as you look around in a number of places there's small little pistol ports so you actually can put your right your pistol yeah. out of that port. There's one on the floor there. So if we're driving over a trench, oh, and some if we think there's a German hiding underneath here somewhere, we've got opportunities to try and get at all the different angles. So some of those ports as well, you'll see them on the floor, on the sponsors on the side, and actually on the roof. Because again, they've learned that experience from the Mark Ones. If German soldiers are jumping on the top of the tank, crowbar, stick grenade, trying to prise their way yeah. in, you need to be able to shoot them off the roof. Right. You want to tell us a bit about the engine and how the engine's working? Yeah, you're actually sitting on the engine here. This is something called a, a Daimler sleeve valve silent night engine. And really it's a, a pre-war tractor engine. The Daimler engines are being made under license in the UK. This one is a type of engines they use in the Mark I tank. It's really based on a framework 
with the gearbox and differential at the back. And what they do is they use the same engine. They were hoping to get a new engine called, designed by a chap called Harry Ricardo. They were hoping to get it in the Mark IV tank. It wasn't really ready in time. So they carry on using this petrol engine, starting handle at the rear. Four of you needed to turn that starting handle. Wow. Um, and you actually need four crewmen to drive it. So not only do the driver with his clutch and his brake pedal, but the commander's got a role in driving it as well. So if we're going to turn left or right, yeah. first thing we have to do is we bash on the metal work yeah. um, to get the other gearsman's attention. Yeah. Um, noise of the engine when it's running is so loud that we won't be able to talk. We don't have speaking tubes, yeah. don't have internal comms that way. So as soon as we bashed on that metal work, get their attention, hand signal one or two, left or right, that indicates which direction we're going to go in. Yeah. And once the driver depresses the clutch, commander ends up moving the differential, which is this, watch your ears, <coughs> terrible noise on the top there. One of those gearsmen at the back, yeah. and there's little gear levers in these square sections on the rear. What he does is he lifts up those gear levers, and in essence, what he's doing is he's disengaging this engine yeah. from turning the track on one side or the oh, other. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. So if you stop the track on one side, the, the other, other track side. turns, you keep moving around the corner. So that is not an easy thing to do For at the job. best of times, yeah. let alone under the stress of combat, noise, smoke, rough ground. As you can see, this is pre-health and safety. Everything's designed to smack you on the head or you know, it cause you real problems in this sort of space there. But that's the idea about getting a well-trained crew, being able to do something like that. Under without, those conditions. Under those conditions, don't stall the engine, because if you stall the engine, you're then the sitting duck as a target. Now, the conditions must have been just atrocious. I mean, the sound, uh, the smell, the fumes. Can you tell them what it was like actually being Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's some brilliant first-hand accounts of guys who are going into actions in the tanks. They all talk about the noise. Yeah. Um, this engine, once it's run for about half an hour, the exhaust going through the top here, these glow red hot. So this can be a tremendously hot space after next to no time. The manifolds on the engine, quite often when they heat up, they separate from the engine. And that means we're pumping carbon monoxide into this right. space. Driver and commander up the front, they're getting a little bit more fresh air coming in. But some of the other crew members and there's a big report done in 1918 where they look at crew conditions and some of the casualties. And the point they say there is often they're finding crew members with carbon monoxide poisoning. What happens is you don't know you're getting it. You get yeah, drowsier course, yeah. yourself. You just fall asleep and don't wake up. Well, uh, or the commander yells you an order and they were finding guys who would repeat the order back to them but not actually execute it. And it's only when you get outside and you get some fresh air coming in, you start vomiting, start throwing up, and that's an indicator you were getting you carbon monoxide. Carbon it's kind of cool being in here when it's not in action. It, it, it doesn't feel too bad. What always surprised me, we, we open this one up and we can get eight people in and yeah. we do a little talking. Oh, it must be claustrophobic. Though. And, and that's what I was saying. And it's quite surprising how quickly just eight people without, the engine's not running, we're not doing any activity, but how hot it gets quite quick. Yeah. You also notice how many people suddenly you'll find someone saying, I don't really like this, do you mind if I get out? You know, because oh, yeah, they, they, again, that sense of, I'm not sure I can get out in a hurry. So the claustrophobia comes across. Um, but the sensation of actually, again, you know, it's static, we're not being thrown around the place, but you still can't help. However careful you are, suddenly someone's going, oh, I'll whack my head on yeah. and it's not even moving. You know, and that's all before the Germans start firing at you. That's, yeah, that's, uh, that's a big one when the Germans start firing at you. Now, other than the protection stuff, the external protection and things, well, you're holding something here, which you're going to show us. Um, what kind of protection did the guys have in case bullets or something did get in, or gas or whatever? So when you wear your clothing, what they tended to wear was overalls or a tunic. They found in the summer, it was so ridiculously hot in here, there's accounts of the guys, they're wearing their shorts. There's one battle where some of the guys at the end of the battle, they're climbing out the back of the tank in their underpants. It's been so oh. hot inside, just that. Um, there's the issue as well of not just burning yourself, touching hot things, bashing your head. The very first Mark I tanks, they issue a leather crew helmet like this one here. It looks a bit like a sort of modern cycling helmet. Yeah. It's just really like a bit of a crash helmet to take a little bit of oh, the impact. Okay. Yeah, sure. The problem was the crews, when they climbed out from the front or the side, that doesn't look dissimilar to a pick alba without the... Oh boy. They were yeah. being shot at by their own guys who didn't recognize a helmet. So these don't last very long. They're not very popular. 
Guys would sometimes wear a soft clap. Yeah. You don't wear your peak forward because, again, when you go up to a vision port, you knock it off the back of your yeah, head. Of course. So they sometimes turn them round. Sometimes a soft cap comforter made out of wool. Again, that will take some of the blows. But the honest truth is most of these guys are going to hit themselves all yeah. over the place. The other big problem they've got, of course, is when the Germans are firing at the vehicle, the impact of a bullet, the lead core, quite often on the impact on the steel would melt. And that means you end up with things called bullet splash. So you've got that flying around the place. Now, if you look around the tank, there's actually where the joins are, where they're riveted, yeah. vision ports, etc. There's quite a number of holes in this vehicle. And that bullet splash would find its way in, gets in your eye, it blinds you. So a little later, they issue the crews with these face masks. And um, this is the sort of thing, if you're a First World War tank crewman, tended to get saved and brought back because it was a symbol, you were the guy yeah, that served in a tank in tank World War One. And the idea is they're still covered in leather, a little bit of chain mail underneath, and these slits to look through. And you bent the mask to fit your face. And it was tied around the back of the head with these ties here. Um, the crews didn't really like them. Well, because it must have been a bit hot too. Absolutely. You imagine, first of all, you're in this claustrophobic space. You've got very little vision out that way. So putting that over your face as well is not going to really make you help. There are images of the guys with these around their necks. Again, I do wonder sometimes if it's almost like, again, it's a symbol, I'm one of these guys. Um, because that idea that as a tank crewman, yeah. you're a little bit of an elite. Um, and that, just like American paratroopers in World War II with their boots or whatever it happens to be, that sense of identifying with a bit of kit yeah. um, to show off what your role is. So if you have a look there, you, that's one of the six pounder gun positions. Right. You can see there's an arm, that arm actually folds down, but it comes out the back and the idea is, by leaning on that arm or going left to right on it by putting your body weight against it, it would actually turn the gun so you can aim. Uh -huh. And then you look through the telescope that's on the top there oh, yeah. um, for aiming. Oh, yeah. And there's a pistol grip underneath the breech, which you can just see on the side oh, yeah. there. And that's what you'd actually pull to fire the gun. Now, this has got, a, obviously it's a mail tank. There's a six pound around, stows around. Firing that gun off, there's a wonderful account at the Battle of Combray where they're under so much fire coming at the tank, they go to open the breach and they can't even get around in because there's actually German machine gun bullets coming down the gun, wow. entering the tank as soon as they open the breach. So the fire that some of these guys are under, you know, it's, yeah. it feels a little claustrophobic Staggering. right now, but absolutely, you would attract the fire. Um, and there's this account of a Mark IV returning. They thought they... The guy describes it as if it was painted silver. It's actually bullet splash all over the, the side thing. of the vehicle that's being fired that close at it. Wow. I try to picture that. Well, why don't we go outside and we can talk a little bit about the armor and the power and speed and some of the actual, actual battle situations. Okay, now we're in front of the Mark IV and can you tell us about the armor? Yeah, this armor now on the Mark IV is a bit thicker than the original Mark I tank. You're looking here at about 0.47 of an inch or about 1.2 centimeters, something like that. Um, it'll stop a bullet. It will stop the SMK bullet, the standard bullet that they're firing from a rifle as now armor piercing round. Um, so that, in that sense, is quite effective. What it won't stop at all is things like shell fire. Okay. So if you've got a high explosive going out, um, bits of that shell casing could easily penetrate. And one of the biggest ways they're knocking out tanks, and they're starting to learn the Germans about knocking out tanks, is keeping artillery near to the front line. Yeah. Um, they were using 77 millimeter, the standard field gun. They put them on smaller wheels. They start hiding them in little places so that they only just bring the them tank. out. Literally just for the tank. So there's ways they're coming up with anti-tank uh, uh, methods of trying to defeat them. But um, don't forget, really, the whole point of this armor plate is just keeping the crew safe inside sure. as it's being acted as a battering ram. It's not out there to defeat other types of things, like we haven't got enemy tanks to fight against yet. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, good point. Um, now here, there's some World War II stuff on the plate. There was a World War II, spoiler, sorry. Um, now you mentioned before we were shooting uh, about this particular tank. Can you tell, can you tell them the little the story of this tank? Yeah, so what happens is the Navy actually teaches the tank corps, the guys in the tanks, how to fire the guns because they realize when you're on driving this thing, going across the First World War battleship, it's not dissimilar, or but ground in the First World War, it's not dissimilar to firing from a, a naval ship at sea where it's pitching all over the place. 
So at the place called Whale Island, a little bit further along the coast from here, in Portsmouth Dockyard, the Navy trains the tank core gunners how to fire on a, from a pitching surface. Now, after the First World War, they actually thank the Navy by giving them this particular First World War tank. And this ends up sitting as what we now call a gate guard. It sits there at Whale Island in Portsmouth. Thank you very much for having the vehicle there. Now, World War II comes along and Britain in the summer of 1940 is desperately worried we're going to be invaded by the Germans again. So pretty much any sort of munition is reactivated. Tanks here at the museum are taken off to defend the base, um, historic tanks. And this particular tank is actually got going again by a crew at Whale Island and it patrols Portsmouth Dockyard during the early years of World War II. All right. And now what about that? I know people have been watching this the whole time and they're saying, talk, tell us about that. Tell us about that. So this whopping great lamp on the top here is what we're looking at here is a mock-up of something that would be called a fascine. So the idea is it dates back to Roman time, fasces, fascists are named after them, bundles of wood tied together. And the whole thing is it's, it's a long-term military engineering thing. If you've got a hole in the ground, fill it with a bundle of brushwood. Now how they do that, chestnut palings or brushwood, they would put chains around it, pull two tanks away in opposite directions to tighten that chain up, okay. put a bolt through it, put it on the top of the tank there. And this was done ahead of the Battle of Combray in November of 1917. And the whole idea is as you drive forward to a German trench, you stop at the front of it, release the chains, and that means that that fascine drops into the German trench and you can cross it and continue the advance. So it's really just a, a whole thing. Still do it today. The modern military engineers, instead of making them out of wood now, they're made out of uh, plastic drain pipe, okay. um, but still these massive great bundles and it means and the tank can, can drive over the top of it. Well, speaking of the engines, um, how powerful were the engines on the Mark IV and how, how fast could they go and what was their range? How far could they go before you had to... Well, the, the, the engine in here, this Daimler sleeve valve engine, is about 105 horsepower, um, which is underpowered to push this 30, 28 tons range sort of tank along. That's, a, that's a not enough oomph behind it. And that's one of the reasons, but going back to development of the tank, constantly they're trying to improve by giving it more power, more mobility. Sure. Um, again, it's a petrol engine, um, top speed, if you're going on flat ground, probably just under four miles an hour but that was about marching pace. So that's about right. So you don't want to lose the infantry coming on behind because don't forget this weapon is for leading the infantry on the attack. There's no point at going 10 miles an hour because the infantry won't be able to keep up with it. Um, in terms of range, how far it can go, it's very much dependent on the terrain it's crossing. Okay. On a nice straight flat road, you can probably end up going 15, 20 miles. Okay. But cross country, you get this ridiculous situation that they're where they're, they're, they're basically these are massively thirsty engines. Yeah. So sometimes you've got the situation where they've gone like literally half an hour and they're actually calling up for a resupply. And one of the biggest problems they had as well is the approach mart to the start off point ready for the attack. Um, even at Combray, they've now learned the lesson that they're starting to bring petrol forward so that you actually refill to get the most out of the vehicle on right. the attack. From the um, it's very hard to actually estimate, and even that for the commanders, how far are we gonna get before we're gonna need a resupply? Because it does depend on the ground. How much are we straining the engine? What oh, if yeah, we belly sure. out? and the tracks so they're having to reverse go forward again reverse go forward again so all of that sort of keeping an eye on your fuel gauge yeah. um, using a dipstick just making damn sure you're not going to run out of fuel at the wrong moment which is by cambrai they're starting to get tanks like that as supply tanks to bring the fuel bring forward fuel forward all right well there you have it the mark IV tank uh, david thank you very much for this thanks and very now much. everybody out there if you're ever in England or if you're dreaming of going to England and you're planning out your trip, you owe it to yourself to come to the Tank Museum, Bobbington, because there are, I mean, 300 tanks and all kinds of other stuff. There's a guy with the last name Hot Black there. That's pretty awesome. Uh, if you'd like to see our episode on tank development, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and all your dreams will come true. See you next time.